All right, Happy New Year, everybody. So recently on one of my more recent videos, I got a comment, or two comments actually, of links to videos which debunk the Game Changers documentary. This was on my video on uh, James Wilkes and Chris Kresser's appearance on the Joe Rogan podcast discussing the film. Now, the first one we could see takes us to a video which is over two hours long. One of the guys in the video is wearing this ridiculous shirt that you can see on the right. So, to be honest with you, he's not somebody that I take seriously at all, and I'm not going to watch the video or respond to it. Now, someone who seemingly is worth taking seriously is the subject of the other link. That would be Lane Norton. Now, Lane made a video on his channel of a similar topic, debunking the Game Changers film. He actually holds a PhD in nutrition. He wrote an accompanying article to this video on his website. Now, Dr. Garth Davis actually posted a long uh, rebuttal of that article on his website. And Red Pill Vegan actually made a, as he puts it, an audiobook version of this Dr. Garth Davis article that you could check out if you want to just listen to it while doing other things. So back to Lane, you might think that because he holds a PhD that his opinion should be gospel and you could take everything that he says as complete fact. Well, we're going to go through his video here and you'll see that he's not being honest really with anything that he says. He and his wife, Holly Baxter, who happens to be a dietitian in her own right, they're just completely missing the mark. Uh, I happen to be a dietitian in my own right. As you can see, I'm not going to give my full name out here on this channel at this time. Um, but anybody that wants to claim, you know, oh, well, I'm just going to listen to Lane and Holly. They're, they're the ones with their credentials. Um, I just thought I would throw that out there and even the playing field. So let's do it without further ado. He claims that he came across this uh, study that determined that gladiators were vegan. The vegetarian diet had nothing to do with poverty or animal rights. Gladiators, it seems, were fat. Consuming a lot of simple carbohydrates such as barley and legumes like beans was designed for survival in the arena. Packing in the carbs also packed on the pounds. Gladiators needed subcutaneous fat because a fat cushion protects you from cut wounds, shields nerves, and blood vessels in a fight. So this starts out really silly, because as someone with a PhD in nutrition, Lane should know that barley and legumes are not simple carbohydrate sources, and even if they were, carbohydrates do not cause weight gain in the context of caloric balance. De novo lipogenesis is not the default pathway for dietary carbohydrates. What makes this even sillier is that Lane's own citation debunks him. So the article he cites is actually an explanation of why the narrative that Gladiators were fat as misguided, and it shows ancient artistic depictions of lean, muscular gladiators as the final nail in the coffin. So then they kind of switch gears and they talk about how we were told for a long time that protein is fuel for exercise, and they kind of create this idea that everyone thinks protein is fuel. They next interview a gentleman by the name of Scott Jurek, and he's an ultramarathon runner. So they try to create the fallacy that protein is fuel for this particular sport. Now, this type of activity is an ultra endurance event. And the primary fuel source that we want to use for that type of exercise is carbohydrate and perhaps some, some fats as well, depending on the duration of that, that activity. So for them to try and make us believe that protein is the fuel source for this type of event is immediately a big no. This part just makes no sense. Lane accuses the film of pushing the false notion that people think protein is a primary exercise fuel, which he claims is ridiculous and that no one actually believes that. Then Holly accuses the film of pushing the idea that protein is a primary exercise fuel. So which is it? The film is trying to debunk the myth that protein is a primary fuel for exercise. It can't also be pushing that myth simultaneously. There's a recent survey of vegans done, thousands of people, and they showed that the average vegan consumed about 83 grams of protein per day. And they actually say in the video, this is 50% more than they need. Now, when they use the term need, they're talking about uh, preventing nitrogen imbalance. So, yeah, or deficiency of protein. <laughs> correct, yeah. So deficiency is a lot different than what's optimal. Optimal, yeah. Right. So, you know, at, at 83 grams of protein per day, 
it's like 1.1 grams per kilo of body weight for a 75 kilogram uh, endurance athlete. So they would need to get way more protein to get to the optimal ratio to prevent nitrogen losses and losses in lean body mass. So Lane cites a study on the general population to support his claim that vegan athletes can't get optimal protein. Keep in mind that these people aren't necessarily athletes, certainly not highly trained ones. I'm a bit perturbed that there is an average cholesterol intake value other than zero for the vegan group. Not sure how that is, but I will return to the study later, particularly this table, because it is a treasure trove of contradictory evidence. Some of Lane and Holly's claims, here's an example before we move on. The same study assessed the diet groups alongside the Healthy Eating Index, which is a measure of diet quality used to assess how well a set of foods align with the key recommendations of the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. The vegan diet had the best score. Now, to be fair, the guidelines aren't set up for athletes either, which is the focus of this video. But it's quite interesting that they're leaving this info out because it doesn't jive with their fear-mongering. Also saying that protein is not any source of fuel is also a little bit misleading. So in the video, Scott Loomis actually says that when you replace uh, carbohydrate with protein, you're depleting your muscle of glycogen. And that's not actually true. There is a mechanism called gluconeogenesis that actually enables protein to be converted to carbohydrate for energy. So again, another uh, false claim. Okay, Holly, so you just said the film is pushing the idea that protein is fuel for exercise, which is, in your words, a big no-no. Now you say, well, you know, gluconeogenesis is a thing that turns protein to glucose. So don't say that protein isn't a fuel. Again, make up your minds. Should we just eat a bunch of protein and no carbohydrates because of gluconeogenesis? Like, what exactly are you saying? So this idea that you can't have protein if you're an endurance athlete or you don't need protein is a complete fallacy. So this is why experts recommend a diet that is adequate in protein, high in carbohydrate, and low in fats for endurance athletes. So a vegan diet. In your own study, again, the vegan group consumed the most carbohydrate, least amount of fat, and yes, adequate protein, because this wasn't an athlete study. So the proportions are best for the vegans. You can just scale up if you are an athlete. I'd also like to point out that the reigning Olympic champion in the marathon and current world record holder, Eli Kipchoge of Kenya, eats a predominantly plant-based diet with protein intakes that would probably be considered low by lane standards. But the guy is a machine. Also interviewed a strong man, and he actually broke the world record carry for the heaviest carry. Mm -hmm. And what they didn't show was his meal plan. Now, his meal plan included a bunch of different amino acids, essential amino acids, and branch chain amino acids. As supplements. As supplements. Yeah, and he also was getting like four protein shakes a day. Exactly. They didn't talk about this, and ironically, you know, they cherry-picked this vegan athlete, and he carried uh, 1,223 pounds. Very impressive. But they also neglected to mention that Hat Thor Bjornsson and Brian Shaw, both who eat copious amounts of meat, uh, carried 1,565 pounds in 2017. For some reason, they didn't mention that the meat eaters ended up carrying 300 pounds more. Hmm. More lazy research by these two, so they mock Patrick Baboumian for drinking protein shakes and taking branched-chain amino acids. They cite an article on Brian Shaw where it showed that he also drinks protein shakes throughout the day. And the other guy they mentioned, the mountain from the Game of Thrones, also takes protein and BCAA supplements. This too is from an article they cited. It's unbelievable. I'd also like to point out that Patrick is a full foot shorter and at least 100 pounds lighter than both of the copious meat eaters. So if he's carrying 1,200 plus pounds and the other guys are carrying 1,500 plus, I'd say it's at least comparable pound for pound. Patrick may even have the advantage. So the next thing that blew my mind, <laughs> and I am surprised that they even let this make it into the film, to be honest, and that is the comment about peanut butter sandwiches having the same amount of protein as three ounces of steak or three eggs. One serving of peanut butter, a 32 gram serving of peanut butter has uh, around eight grams of protein. It also has 16 grams of fat and around six grams of carbohydrate as well. So if we do the math, you have to have about 1.25 servings of the peanut butter right. 
if you add, say, two slices of bread to that, each slice of bread has around a gram of protein. Uh, so actually like three or four grams of protein. Uh, sorry, three or four grams of protein, 14 grams of carbohydrates per slice, and one gram of fat. Now, let's times that by two. That peanut butter sandwich has around 412 calories. Yeah, at least. At, at least, least. To match that of the three eggs and the uh, three ounces steak, which has about half the amount of calories. So three eggs would have 200 calories, and uh, three ounces of even like one of the fattiest cuts of steak would have 228 calories. But for most of us, um, we would rather have a little bit more protein per calorie. Again, in your own study, vegans got 14% of their calories from protein, while omnivores got 15%. So you're acting like there's such a huge difference, and it's minute. Also, acting like all this fat on a vegan diet gets in the way of protein, are you kidding? Vegans in your own study got 26% of their calories from fat, and the omnivores got 37% of their calories from fat. They're cherry-picking because peanut butter is high in fat. Funny they didn't bring up the other plant-based food James mentioned in the documentary. It has about the same amount of protein as three eggs or three ounces of beef. That being a cup of cooked lentils. And you get 18 grams of protein for just 230 calories. But we can do better. Three ounces of tempeh gives you over 17 grams of protein for 163 calories. But we can do better still. Five ounces of tofu gives you 17 grams of protein for 147 calories. Lane and Holly aren't going to mention this to you because it directly contradicts their narrative. Moving on. Then progresses into... A, the first burrito experiment. A, a burrito experiment. So they're looking at the... Experiment. Miami Dolphins. We need three different burritos to three different players. Um, one is a vegan burrito. Mm -hmm. One is, I think, has... Um, steak. Steak, and the other has chicken. Yep. Um, and then they look at their blood afterwards. Now, important to note, they don't actually measure endothelial function. They just show the serum. Yeah. So the reason blood looks cloudy is because it has more fats in it. It's not because they ate animal sources of protein. It's because the sources of protein they chose were, were very fat. fatty. Yeah. Now, they said they chose chicken, but they didn't show the macros on the burrito. They didn't show how much fat was in there. But they claim that, oh, well, there was avocado in the vegan burrito and still it didn't end up cloudy. Well, they didn't show us what the calories were and they didn't show us what the fats were. And this was also sponsored by the Haas Avocado Board, which they also neglected to mention. Mm. So, uh, yeah. Well, Lane, let's see what effect high amounts of fat in the blood have on endothelial function. Serum triglyceride levels are significantly associated with cardiovascular risk factors and a decrease in flow-mediated vasodilation. So Lane tries to plant some doubt in your mind that lots of fat in your blood is inconsequential, and it's really sad coming from a PhD holder in nutrition. Also note that increases in visceral fat cause endothelial dysfunction. And in his own study, once again, the vegan group had the lowest percentage of overweight and obese individuals and the highest percentage of healthy weight individuals, and the omnivore group had the exact opposite, most overweight individuals and obese, and the fewest at a healthy weight. Now, we actually looked at studies that measured endothelial function <laughs> with lean sources of animal protein. So we're talking about dairy, fish, chicken. They showed, they showed no reduction in endothelial function. In fact, they even had one showing that when they gave lean beef that systolic blood pressure decreased and endothelial function improved. So he's talking about this study which was funded by the Beef Checkoff Program. I guess it's only okay if Lane cites industry-funded research. So knowing the funding source, you have to take a deeper look at the methodology. And what we see in this study is that, first off, there's no vegan group, but also in the diet groups where they added more and more red meat, the total fat and saturated fat were held at 27 to 28% and 6% respectively. While the baseline diet had 33% of its calories from fat and 12% from saturated fat. So they lowered total fat and saturated fat elsewhere in the diets despite adding in more red meat. But again, in your own study, the vegans ate far less total fat and saturated fat than the omnivore group. Another study cited by Lane on his article on his site is this one on dairy. One of the authors of the paper was employed by the National Dairy Council at the time of the research. But remind us again about all the BS avocado industry studies. They found that dairy snacks could improve reactive hyperemia. 
which is the return of blood to a previously restricted area. Think of when you get your blood pressure checked and your hand gets cold. Cuff comes off, blood rushes back in, that's reactive hyperemia. Now, research has shown that reactive hyperemia occurs via potassium channel activation. So, back to the study now. We can see that the dairy group was consuming more potassium daily, almost 25% more than baseline and the non-dairy group. The non-dairy snacks offered are not particularly healthy overall or potassium rich. I'd like to see this study redone with some fruit opposite the dairy. Here are some of the top sources of dietary potassium via the National Institute of Health. Have they replaced the apple juice with orange juice, the snack bar with the banana, and the pretzels with raisins? We may have had different results. So excessive calorie intake is what causes us to gain weight. And if, again, looking at a survey of vegans versus non-vegans, vegans consume on average 600 calories less per day than the average uh, omnivore. Mm -hmm. So again, it's not surprising that they wouldn't have high levels of inflammation because they're controlling their calories more than omnivores are. So when omnivores eat more calories than vegans, it's not the fault of their diet itself, but the fault of the individual. But it is the fault of the vegan diet when vegans get less protein than omnivores. So what they don't talk about is that vegans have what's called a health-seeking behavior profile. Can you explain to our viewers what that means? So basically, vegans tend to seek out healthier behaviors. Generally, their lifestyles are a little bit more low risk. Um, they look to, they're probably more active, they don't smoke. Um, they generally want to pursue matters of health. Best, most tightly controlled studies show very little to no association with meat and cancer or cardiovascular disease. Well, we can look at the Adventist cohorts for this type of information because the Seventh-day Adventist population all have a health-seeking behavior profile, as they say. Their lifestyles outside of diet are very similar and generally health-seeking. So what trends do we see with the Adventists? Well, cutting out meat reduces total cancer risk, and cutting out dairy and eggs then reduces it further. And we see similar results for all-cause mortality as well. Several studies with the Mediterranean diet, which is like a 30% protein, yeah, moderate carb, moderate fat, uh, but very low in saturated fat, they actually show that it reverses a lot of the cardiovascular risk factors. Yeah, and they actually claim in the video as well that the vegan diet is the only diet that is able to actually reverse some of these cardiovascular uh, conditions. So, yeah, funny they didn't talk about the Mediterranean diet in the video. Yeah, again, and another example of cherry picking. They didn't talk about the Mediterranean diet because it has never been clinically shown to take a clogged artery and unclog it. Lane and Holly are conflating improving cardiovascular markers with literally reversing cardiovascular disease. It's beyond egregious. Okay, men, this one's for you. Eating meat will make your dick go soft. Erectile dysfunction has several risk factors, including coronary artery or peripheral vascular disease, hypertension, obesity, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia, all of which are consistently shown to be less prevalent in vegan populations. We spoke about endothelial function earlier. We can look back to the Adventist cohort paper here for BMI, hypertension, and diabetes statistics, and also a meta-analysis from 2015, which looked at blood, lipids, and vegetarian diets, which included vegan diets in some of the studies. Statistically significant reduction in total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol were found for the meatless diets. I realized that erectile dysfunction is not always a vascular issue. Sometimes it can be hormonal, where the issue is not that blood can't enter the penis, but that the brain doesn't know to send it there. But these factors can't be ignored if you can reduce risk of several major risk factors of erectile dysfunction you will likely reduce your chances of getting erectile dysfunction in the first place. So that's all I have for today. Thanks for watching. Remember to always stay informed, stay critical, and most importantly, stay compassionate. The time to go vegan is now.